Thanks, guys. And gals. Yeah, we use that generic guys, you know. Praise God there's some gals up there. Otherwise, they guys are ugly. You know, I just thought of this. If you're visiting with us, uh, you need to realize this. I got this, this deal going that there's no such thing as a good-looking guy. Uh, but I always give the guys opportunities. Say, hey, you know, you're, you're really looking good. All the guys are supposed to, at that cue, turn to their wives or their girlfriends and say, he's talking to you, honey. If I say you're good-looking, I'm not talking to the guys, right? Uh-huh. That's true. If I say, um, you're not looking good, that's a cue for the women to go, he's talking to you, honey. <clears throat> well, this morning, we are, if you're visiting with us or if you've been gone for a while on vacation, uh, snowbirdish type or whatever, um, know this, that we are in a series about the Holy Spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit, emphasizing the Holy Spirit, focusing on Him. We've been talking about His divinity, his personality. This morning we're going to be talking about his presence. His presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit. But we're also going to be talking about his power and later in the series, his fruit, his purpose, his gifts, all those different aspects of the Holy Spirit. Now if you're with me, you've been with us for the last several weeks, you realize that there's nothing to be afraid of. God loves us. He is God. He's, he's there to help us. He's you know, everything there to guide us, to instruct us, to bring comfort. He's called the advocate. Um, so we just need to be relaxed and comfortable and welcome his presence. Sometimes people, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, they're like, oh, you know, paranoid or, or you know, weirded out and stuff. Um, this morning, um, at the, towards the end of the service, we're gonna spend the time in part of the service. We gather together as a church. I'm gonna give opportunity. I'm gonna invite you to come up front here and stand at the altar. Uh, we refer to this as the altar, uh, even though there's no altar here, but we kind of make an altar before God right here. I'm gonna invite you to come and stand here and, and basically say, God, I want all that you have for me. God, I want all that you have for me. Fill me, baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Before we go there, I want to just talk about this idea of his presence. To see that all through the scriptures, I mean, his presence is everywhere. It's just, you read it, it's through and through and through and through and through and through, you see about the presence of the Holy Spirit. But before we go there, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, was on the Isle of Patmos. The Isle of Patmos was like a, a prison uh, for convicts, some of the worst and severe kind. They'd send them out to this desert, this island uh, called Patmos, where they couldn't escape, they couldn't get away. And the reason why John was there is because they tried to kill him. All the apostles died a martyr's death. Okay, they all were martyred. Peter refused to be crucified on a cross like his master, their savior, said, I can't even come close. He said, so he requested to be crucified upside down. Peter, that we read in the Bible, was martyred for his faith on a cross upside down. John, they tried to kill him by throwing him in a pot of boiling oil, but he would not die. Now, I have to admit, we don't know, and I don't know, did he show the signs of being in a fire and scarred up? Don't know. But I know this, they couldn't kill him. So they sent him out to the Isle of Patmos. So we pick up the story in verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, being persecuted. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me in a loud voice like a trumpet. And then we got the rest of the book of Revelation. But I want you to notice there, he says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. I was in the spirit. I think that every one of us 
come into this, this thing about the Holy Spirit coming on people or being filled with the Holy Spirit or something powerful from God happening. And it's, it's kind of a mystery. You kind of wonder what that really looks like. Friends, here's what you need, we need to realize. Jesus said that where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in their midst. Amen? Amen. That means that Jesus is in our presence right now. Amen. We talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit is divine. He's omnipresent, just like Jesus. So too, right now, we are standing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. Amen? Amen. He is here. But John says, and it kind of seems to single out or specify, it was on, on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. Do you realize that for every one of us, what he's referring to there is kind of a willful choice, a conscious decision the Lord's presence wasn't probably any more manifest than at any other time. But John says, and you seem to read, read by that, that I intentionally went seeking to be in his presence in an aware sense. In a weird sense? Is that, is that a word? Are you with me? In a sense that God's presence was more manifest. That his presence was more made aware to him because of his seeking and his desire to want to be in it. He was going after it. He quieted the, the, the noise of the world, and, he realized, and then he realized, like we're always there, but he somehow had this, this realization, I'm in a more aware sense of the Spirit's presence. You know, in a sense, because of the series, that's really where we are heading. And I want to encourage you, in your daily devotions on your way to work, in your everyday life, to be more aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That you too would be, you know, I was just on my way to work and I, and I, was, in the, I, I was in the Spirit. There was something about it. I was seeking, I was praying for some people. I was in the Spirit on a Monday or on a Tuesday. It can be any day and every day. But some days there are just those more special times and be, it usually has to be when we're really seeking, we're really after, and we're searching after God. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. It was intentional. It was this idea of presence, an aware sense of presence. That's what we're gonna be looking for and trying to step into this morning. But again, not just this morning, in the coming weeks and months and years, I hope, for us, stirring up something that is good. Lord, help us peel back the shades and the darkening that the blinders of the world have put on us, that we could see and be in your presence more often, in a more manifested way. Amen? Okay. I always encourage you to bring your Bibles. I'd love for you to follow along in your Bibles. Now, if you're visiting with us and you don't bring your Bible, we always have Bibles up on the trons. And for those of you, if you forget your Bibles, but I really, I encourage you to bring your Bibles. There's something about having your Bible in your hand, looking at it, being able to write in it and scribble in it and all that kind of thing. And don't worry, that's not sacrilegious. Okay, you can write in your Bible, write notes to yourself, write exclamation marks, underline it, and just use it up. But this morning... I'm gonna ask you to close your Bible. <laughs> of all strange Sundays, I want you just to close it because it's not gonna be worth trying to follow along. I'm not gonna wait for you to turn there one after another because I'm gonna, this morning, pretty much for the bulk of the message, I'm just gonna read scripture verse after scripture verse because I want you to, I want us to just soak in and understand this idea of the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna be reading many Bible passages, many scriptures, but believe me, friends, these are just a very thin scratch in a narrow line of the scriptures that talk about the presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We are literally just gonna get a scratch of it, but to get an idea, we just don't normally not read it, notice it. You're reading the scriptures and you never really paid attention about the presence of the Holy Spirit. How he is there has been all the time. Amen? Amen. Okay, so we're going to begin 
in the book of Genesis. Now, if, if you want to write down the Trans, or if you want a, a request of all these scripture verses that I used this morning, uh, you can either watch it online and, and follow along and write them down, or you just call the office, say, would you, Kelly, would you um, send me a, a, a text or a whatever, a, a PDF or a, I, I, whatever, however, however, if you want it, you'll get it. Put it that way, okay? Right now, I just want you to listen and, and, and follow along in the Word of God. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Do we see that even in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? And guess what? In the very beginning, what we see is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Baziel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. I love this particular passage of scripture where it talks about, I have filled him with the spirit of God and with wisdom. They were about building the temple and he says, I'm, I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna, the spirit of God's gonna be with him. He's gonna have special insights. He's gonna be able to see things and be extremely cr uh, crafty or, or uh, skilled in his work. Now, again, when you and I think about the Holy Spirit coming on somebody, do we have a Hollywood version or do we, do we, have we seen movies, have we heard things? Uh, what, what do we think that looks like? Okay, Baziel, Baziel, or whatever the guy's name was, he was sitting there, all of a sudden the Spirit of God came on him. Oh, dear Jesus! Oh, sorry, Jesus wasn't born yet. Oh, dear God! I mean, the Spirit of God came on him and he, whoa! Oh, man, I got all kinds of insight into wisdom and think, no, it probably didn't operate that way. The Holy Spirit came on him, and out of his regular work, he was just better than average. He was, he was skilled at it. He just had certain insights into it that he, he just knew what he knew, and he didn't even really understand probably at times why he knew it. There are some of you in your work and in your jobs, you're extra good, you're extra sharp. You see things at times that others don't see, and I believe that that would be the Spirit of God on you that all of a sudden you just, you step into a situation and you see things and you do things, that's a gift of God. I mean, really, honestly, do any of us think we're all that? That's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came on him that he would have the giftings and the skills to be able to do such things. Know this, I really believe that when you sign up to teach a, teach a Bible study, you teach, sign up to work in nursery, you sign up to do whatever else, there is an impartation, there's a, a pouring out of God's spirit in your life so you can do that. Otherwise, every one of us, with fear and trepidation, approach anything that God asks us to do or any of us attempt to do. Amen? So I love this, um, that the spirit of God, he says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. Okay, this was the, the setting of Jethro, his father-in-law. He said, Moses, what you do is not good. You sit all day and you listen to the people. He said, what you ought to do is elect some people who are gifted in, in leadership and wisdom, you know, they're kind of mature, and appoint them to hear some of the cases as well. That's the setting. Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and he put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they never did it again after that, except for that one time. The spirit of God came down on them and they prophesied the presence of the Holy Spirit. Judges chapter six, verses 33 and 34. Now all the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan, and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. 
and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Ab- Aberazites to follow him. The Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. I guess if the Spirit of the Lord comes on you and you have a trumpet in your hand and you're supposed to blow that trumpet, you're going to blow that trumpet. You're going to probably blow that trumpet with a little bit more energy and emphasis. I love that. The Spirit of God. You know, you in, in our devotions, we read through this, we've never really noticed because we haven't been really paying attention the presence of the Holy Spirit coming on and being with people so often prevalent. Look at, uh, with me on the trons there, Judges chapter 11. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. The Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. I mean, it's just interesting to see the presence. And again, like I said, we're just scratching the surface. Judges chapter 13, 24 and 25. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord, listen to this, began to stir him while he was in Mana Dan between Zurah and Eshtal. I love that. And the Spirit of God began to stir in him. Every one of us, we're always a little bit apprehensive. So what does the Spirit of God happen? What does it do when, we, when, when we're getting prayed for or whatever else? And, and later this morning, you know, many of you, you're gonna be, we're going to be filling this, this altar area here. And you're going to be praying. And some of you, because it's going to be the first time you've ever went and got prayed for for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And some of you, you're going to be wondering, Oh boy, what's gonna happen? Is is God gonna knock me down? Am I gonna just start speaking in tongues? Am I? Relax. Relax. The Bible says the spirit is like is like a wind that blows where it will. And it has all sorts of different reactions in every one of us differently. Sometimes we have scared people by our language. You know, the spirit of God was moving in my life and, and I just had to do this. Well, they hear you had to do that. In other words, you didn't have a choice. You see, our terminology and the words we use sometimes confuses people. What it means is this. The Spirit of God was drawing me. I felt the Spirit of God compelling me. I felt the Spirit of God stirring me. And I wanted to. I mean, I could have resisted if I wanted but we use the words, I couldn't help it. I just, you know, so the, 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 the picture sometimes we get in our minds is that the Spirit of God's gonna come on you, he's gonna crank your head back, your tongue's gonna start speaking, and you're, you know, and, or you're gonna do the crappie flop on the carpet, or, you, what, you know, whatever it is. That is not, that is not. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. First Samuel 10.10 10. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. So Saul is out there, and he sees these prophets coming by, and all of a sudden, because these prophets are coming by, uh, again, a supernatural move of God, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him. Again, even when you read that word powerfully, what does that mean? It came powerfully on him. It was heavy. It was rich. It was obvious. It was something that moved in his life. This morning, the Holy Spirit's gonna move powerfully in some of your lives, but on the outside looking at you, we might not be able to tell. But you'll be changed forever. Amen? Amen? You guys, I am so anxious to get to the end of this message so we can pray. So we can pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, over the past weeks, you've heard me share stories. Okay, I'm not that old, but I'm not that young yet either. I, I, I talk like an old person sometimes because I have memories. I talk about the old days. I remember back in the day when the Spirit of God came down and we saw people being baptized. There was a hunger of the church at the time of the 70s and the 80s. People were going after it. They were discovering that there was this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they were going after it. And, you know, 
stories that I've shared with you of people just getting baptized and speaking in tongues and, and just the miracles that were taking place with this outpouring. And it wasn't, it was a special outpouring in a sense, but it really was more God seeking after what the Bible talked about. Powerfully. You know, I, I have been in, in powerful times in, in the presence of the ministry of, the, of God and not a whole lot of outward display would have been taking place. I can remember many times, and again, I've told some of these stories in the past. One in particular, well, many times that I've really been in the presence of God in such a supernatural way, just a divine presence that was just overwhelming. I mean, you're bawling, you're just weeping, and I don't know how to describe it, but it's just God's presence is so overwhelming, and you feel so undone. You feel so unworthy to be in that kind of presence that you want to crawl under the carpet. And here's what's really cool. I don't know how to describe it except for this. You, in the worst way, you're trying to crawl under the carpet, but you feel God and his love reaching you to pull you out of the carpet. <laughs> but God, I want to hide from your presence, but I want to love you. I want to embrace you. I'm so undone. I'm so unworthy. God, your presence, I feel it's just, and, and, and so you're trying to hide and he's trying to draw. And it's like, wow. And at the time that's happening, here's what probably other people on the outside see. Oh, oh God. Oh, your presence. Oh, your presence, oh God. We long for your presence. The Spirit of God came powerfully. It says it came powerfully on him. Today, many of you are gonna talk about the time that the Spirit of God came powerfully on you. And some of us will remember seeing you up at the altar and we're gonna go, really? Second Samuel 23. These are the last words of David. The inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse, utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. So there's this, this epitaph or this, this, this prelude to this, um, what David's work has done. Then they quote David. Now David's words start this way. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me his word was on my tongue. David recognized and was now letting everybody know that, you know, many times, there was many times when I began to so start a new song or worship or pen some thoughts, what I realized it was the Spirit of God that gave me these words. The Spirit of God moved in my heart and my life, and it was the utterance of his tongue that moved through my life. Then we get to the book of Joel, the prophet Joel, chapter two, verse 28 and 29. If you've been around Pentecostal circles at all, this is a foundational uh, verse, a passage of scripture that we all point and go back to. In fact, even Peter on the, on the day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost was there, the spirit came down, the tongues of fire, they spoke in tongues, you know the story, they're there, Peter gets up on the roof, and he, right away he hears what people are saying, well these people are acting like a bunch of drunk guys. I mean, it's only nine o'clock in the morning and they're acting like drunkards, you know, because they're, man, they're, they're singing songs and they're worshiping. It's like, this is, he says, these men are not drunk as you suppose, but this is to fulfill what, what the prophet Joel prophesied about. This is what he was talking about. In the last days, God is gonna pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Joel, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Man, we have begun to see those days. Started in Acts chapter two, and it works through to today. John chapter 14. You see, John chapter 14, 15, and 16, it's the end of Jesus' ministry, and he's talking a lot about you need the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the great paraclete, that one that's gonna come alongside and help you. You need him. I'm gonna be sending him to you. I'm gonna be going away, but I'm gonna be sending him to you. In fact, this is one of those passages where he says, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. In other words, one like me is what Jesus is saying. 
one to be with you, just like me. But I'm going to be gone, but he's going to send another. Give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him. I mean, unbelievers cannot accept him. You must be a believer to accept the spirit. It says, because it neither sees him nor knows him. I like this last part. But you know him, for he lives with you, but he will be in you. He's with you, you know him, but he's gonna be in you. Acts chapter two, verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the world can't receive him, but believers can re repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter four, verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I love this, and notice very carefully, you're gonna see in the next couple passages, there are instances where the apostles or somebody laid hands on people, and there's others where it was while Peter was preaching, or in this case, after they had prayed. They just finished their prayer, and all of a sudden, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all then filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if that's gonna happen today. Maybe, maybe I'd be, I'm lacking faith. I, I would love to. Before I die, to see a place in a time where we could describe it in much the same way, that the place where we were meeting was shaken by the hand of God, and the Holy Spirit came down and filled us. I think that would be marvelous. That would be glorious. I'd love for every one of us to have the hell scared out of us. I mean, to have the hell so scared out of you that you know that there's a God. He is seated on the throne. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I have been in a couple times in places, and again, I've told you these stories where I have felt it sounded like there was a train rushing through this room, and I wouldn't describe it as shaking, but I'm moving my hands because it felt like there was just reverberation in this room that I was in. It was like, man, I opened my eyes fully expecting to see angels circling around the ceiling. I would love for that to happen here. I would love for that to happen here someday. Wouldn't you? I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, that'd be scary. Amen? I, I think, man, just like any move of God, the angels of God, when the, when, remember when Gabriel showed up to say hi to Mary? <laughs> she was terrified. It says She was terrified. When the angels showed up uh, with the shepherds in the field, it says they were terrified. Yeah. When God shows up, it, there is a little bit of terror got in it. Amen? But then he speaks peace be with you, and everything is calm. But I love this. It says the room that they were in was shaken. Acts 8, and when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. You see, people had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They were new believers, but they had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Again, when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 9, 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul, or Paul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 and 45. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. I would not mind, Lord, you have permission at any time to interrupt my message that I've so diligently, thoroughly prepared, and even though I've put all that work into it, you can interrupt it at any time, any Sunday. Amen? Amen? As he began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm back at Acts chapter 10. Um, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. 
okay? Now, in Acts chapter 11, he's retelling that story. And here's how it sounds when he retells it, because he was giving a defense for what happened. He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on and messed up my whole sermon. He had came on them just as he had come on us at the beginning. Peter's saying, you remember in Acts chapter 2, all of us guys were in the upper room? I was speaking, and all of a sudden that happened, just like it happened to us years earlier. Then I remembered what the, what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. I have one more passage of scripture. If you do have your Bibles, you can turn here. If not, continue to look at the trons, and that is the Gospel of Luke. Pastor Bob and the team, if you guys just come, prepare yourselves. We're gonna get ready to, I'm gonna invite you to come up for prayer in just a minute. But I want you to understand with the, with the loving gentleness and the loving kindness that Jesus has for us. It's in Luke chapter 11, and these words are gonna sound familiar, but usually we stop at verse 10. If we just go on a couple more verses, we see the context in which Jesus is speaking this great encouragement to come, to be asked, to knock. Verse nine, says, he, I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then, right in the same context, he goes right into this. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, listen to this. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Friends, what I'm going to ask you to do is in just a moment, I'm going to ask you just to come. Just fill the altars. Just stand here. And we're just going to worship. And I want to encourage you, while you're, while you're up here, try to get any expectations out of your head. You know, just relax. But, but practice active worship. I want to encourage you, don't just sit there and have your mouth closed and just, mm, like I'm enjoying this. And, and it is really enjoyable being in His presence. But I want to encourage you to actively say, God, I worship you. I mean, sing the song that Pastor Bob is, is leading us. Use your own words to say, God, I thank you for my salvation. God, I've never told you how rich you are, how merciful you are. It, it's really cool. One, our daughter, Samantha, out of the blue, two weeks ago, just calls me. It was in the evening. She just calls me out of the blue. It's kind of strange. I've been intensifying my prayer for her. But it's out of the blue. She just picked up, I picked up the phone and says, it was Samantha. I was like, Samantha, what are you doing? Oh, Dad, I was just thinking. I was just thinking about you and Mom and just your generosity, how you took my school loans and you, you, you paid them off. You know, I knew it was a lot of money and you just guys worked it. And I don't think I, I, don't think I ever appropriately thanked you. And I said, sweetheart, we love you. It's really no big deal. I mean, yeah, I could have bought a new car, <laughs> new bike, half a house. I says, no, Samantha, I want you to know we love you. Just don't ever give another thought. You've thanked us, and it's great. But, but I love it, this idea. She said, you know, I thank you, but I'm not sure if I really have expressed from the gratitude of my thanks to you. And some of you for today, that might be the time up here, you say, you know, God, I thank you for my salvation, but I really want to thank you for my salvation. I'm not sure, Father, if I have personally ever appropriately told you how great and grateful I am for your love for your mercy in my life. And 
would you just begin to just step in with that kind of a heart? But don't, I mean, God, I thank you. We'll sing the song and worship. And then, as you come, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt Pastor Bob and, and then I'm gonna pray for you. And then after that, we're just gonna go into a time of worship again. It's just expressing your praise, seeking after God. And in that time, I'm gonna have some of the staff and the board members and, and the prayer team people just circle through and, and they're just gonna lay your, their hand on your shoulder gently. They're just gonna pray a simple prayer. God just, and they're just gonna touch you. So we're gonna do it like in the scripture says here both ways. Just in a group, prayer, but then also individually, just somebody touching you. So those of you, you're saying, God, I'm willing to take the top off my bottle. I want you to pour all of yourself in me. Whether you're a first time person saying, I, I, wanna, I wanna receive the baptism, I wanna receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life. Or whether you're old and crusty. And it's been years since you've hungered after the Spirit of God. Would you come? Come right now. Just get, well, everybody stand. But those of you who want to come and get, come pray, come stand up here. Stand up front.